Welcome to the Art Africa podcast, a platform that uses the power of storytelling to reimagine the African narrative. We are Afro optimists and deep believers in the African continent, using dialogue to celebrate African excellence, especially that of African women. I am Lona Okeng. I am Olga Chichoncho. And we, we are, are the, the builders of Art Africa. Africa. Hi, uh, welcome to another episode of the Arch Africa podcast. We are an Afro-optimist platform to celebrate African excellence. Today, we are at the Lisha Art Gallery um, with Dr. Lilian Nabulime. She is a senior lecturer at the Makere University, Margaret Towell School of the Arts, and also um, a world a, an award-winning sculptor who primarily uses wood as um, her medium of practice. Um, her, work, um, her work in turn gets some of society's most um, pressing challenges, including um, discussions around um, HIV and AIDS and how it affects all of us, whether directly or indirectly. Um, she's also really actively um, using art as a, as a tool for women empowerment and um, women empowerment and emancipation. Thank you so much, Dr. Lillian, for taking the time to speak with us. To just start off our discussion, kindly share the story behind your wonderful cape. Uh, my hat, okay. I've been putting it on since 1995. Uh, we participated, me and a group of artists, we particip participated in a Johannesburg Biennale, and our team was led by Gino Elitumuine. So I remember I think he put all, all of us these hats, which are made by Sanaga Tejia, and we had them all. So since then, I've kept on putting on this hat up to now. And especially when I'm traveling, it is the first thing in my luggage. And when I'm at the borders, I put it on, I see smiles and <laughs> Six of the officers on the other end <laughs> signing my document to allow me, you know, exit, whatever. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the Cape has been a conversation starter in the spaces that you find yourself in. Yeah, especially when I'm on the flights and up north. Yeah. Wow. Wonderful. Yeah, very interesting. You know, art is an interesting conversation starter. And I think there's so many pieces um, surrounding us at the gallery. Um, mm. Very excited to have the tour and um, have you maybe talk us through the symbolism of some of these pieces. But I'm curious to know what, mm. from your experience, what do you think is art's role in society? Uh, art's role, I think the most important is, well, it records the past mm -hmm. in visual form, but it also enables us to talk, to communicate, and you got, what I will realize is that we have so many languages and it is through art you can con communicate all masses of different tribes and languages who use different languages, especially Uganda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that we find very fascinating is I think in society there is this rift between you either doing sciences or you're doing arts, but um, I think the past couple of years has shown us how these two worlds are actually intersect and come together. Mm. Um, and you know, I'm just I think Lona, um, you know, Lona has a very unique profile um, around how she's been able to merge technology with art and some of the trends and some of the opportunities that we're seeing um, around the art space are how, you know, art can be actually seen as a science form. Um, have you had any, you know, previous interactions to see how, like, these two worlds actually merge? Because, you know, a lot of people see them as two different, different spaces. I think the bottom line or the basic is that art is interesting at the same time it enables one to relax at the same time it evokes the mind 
And whether we like it or not, these sciences are entwined with the arts. As I've been through my school days, I remember, especially at the high school, that students who are taking sciences, uh, PCM, PC, uh, biology, chemistry and math, they, their fourth subject would always be art. And amazing, I think they, that creativity enables them to go through their subjects, however tough, because they need to be creative when they are working out their issues or solutions in, in, in the sciences. Yeah. And to my surprise, the government doesn't take art seriously. And yet, with art, with, with the fine arts, they are the source of the, uh, they are the source which enable the mind to develop. And through that, that means people will be always, uh, have, will, will always be creative mm -hmm. to come up with solutions with issues that affect them. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. And um, let's, let's go back 25 years back in time, because you've been a practicing artist professionally for 25 years. We're very mm -hmm. curious to know um, what were the, how did you go about picking the career path that you chose back in school or earlier? Mm, I think I went to good schools. Primarily, I went to Shimon, Shimon Primary School. We had good teachers. Unfortunately, my parents also were very creative. They were not fully uh, that they were artists, but they were very creative. I remember my mother and father, whenever they would do something, they had interest in it, and they would make sure that everything is technically uh, well designed. For example, the houses, the gardens. Mm -hmm. So my mother into, was always into gardening, cooking, mm -hmm. and my father was into architecture, making sure that the houses we lived in were well done, were comfortable, and whatever, in and out, everything was, was well cared, mm -hmm. taken care of artistically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in secondary school? Second, uh, from secondary school, uh, because of the wars, we were transferred to Masaka, Nkoni. And then from Nkoni, that means we still were uh, placed in schools in Masaka. So I went to Christ the King, Kali Sizo, and there I had very good teachers. Mm -hmm. And then one of them is uh, Mrs. Luboa. And then one of them was also Michala and Daula, Mrs. Sintaula, she was younger. Then as there was in my, uh, uh, started off in Tanzania, coming through Masaka, then we, we were transferred to Makeo College School. And I remember the late Samuel Njuba was the one who got us a place at Makeo College School. While I was there, I saw a student working with their boards to the School of Fine Art, which was near. And there I was in O level. And I remember my the professor, one of my professors, um, Mr. Uh, what is it? Uh, well, there was uh, Mr. Salongo Chaze, was the headmaster. And then Nagenda, Professor Nagenda, was, I don't know for what reason, they came to our home in Zambia. And then my father introduced them to me. And I remember after when they had gone, I talked to my father and said, I would like to be an artist. And then my father said, oh, does art bring uh, food on the table? But I just kept quiet. But when, because I was in all levels at Makeo College School, I was performing very well in the fine arts. So I decided to take art, geography, and economics at HSC. Many people laughed, but for me, it was the fine arts where I was performing better. There was no point to take a fourth principal. Mm -hmm. So I passed and came to the School of Fine Art and I started enjoying making art. Yeah. Wow. Um, and that was under Professor Nagenda's? Yeah, regime, but the head of the, of the school was Mutsango Guantam, mm -hmm. Professor Mutsango Guantam. Yeah. It's beautiful. And how were you able to narrow down between the various art forms and, and, and mediums of expression to narrow down to sculpting as opposed to maybe painting um, and the other the other artistic options? Well, they were compulsory subjects, but then I remember I took painting and sculpture. 
So I've, I, I graduated in, in 1987. And my father was sick at that time, he was suffering from HIV AIDS, he was dying. And I went to him and told him, oh, I've got, then he said, oh, what class did you get? Then I told him, now I've got an upper second. He said, oh, that is a very good class. Mm -hmm. Then he said, can you go back to the School of Fine Art and ask for an opportunity to teach? I walked in in Sango Guantamo's office, and then he said, oh, I asked him for the opportunity. He said, yes, you can come and teach with us. And then he said, but while you are teaching, uh, as a teaching assistant, you also have to think about your masters. And then I said, mm, maybe I'll do my masters in painting. He said, no. <laughs> I was surprised. He said, I, yes, you are very good in sculpture. Wow. So I had done sculpture unknowingly that it was the source of interest. But I remember making those small sculptures, which I uh, had to bring up a lot of where I ended up making so many because I had a, a roommate and she would always bring so many visitors in the room. And I never wanted to stop her because I said, now I'm going through the field, these are people who might help me. So when the visitors came in, I would just get the small place and make small sculpture. So by the time I finished, graduated in sculpture, I had lots of work. So the, and then Musango Kwatem said, you're going to do sculpture. And I said, okay. But then I started looking about the subject matter I was going to work on. And I, because mon, mon, most of the subjects, women who, others had worked on them. And then Musango Kwatem said, well, how about roots? And I'd never thought about roots. So at that time when I was walking around the campus, I would see root outcrops, I would take photos, then draw, sketch, and make maquettes in clay. But then one day there was a heavy wind, wind and rain, so it uprooted a number of trees at the university. And that's when I could see what went below the uh, the ground, uh, creative forms, grotesque forms, but which were very wonderful to inspire, inspire me to make sculptures. So my master's was developing sculptures from tree roots. Right. Yeah. And on to your, um, your PhD now, because you're a doctor. Yes, I will. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's a doctor, but PhD. Yeah, yes. PhD. So when I finished my PhD, that was around 1993, and I had made these huge sculptures. And that was a time, you know, sometimes people make comments, and I remember I said, oh, and I, I feel that my sculptures were huge, big, and I was small at that time. And then they had filled up, and instead of somebody appreciating the work I'd done, someone would say, oh, she's a woman, she has just done those pieces. And I said, no one can take, can look down upon me. I took time to produce these sculptures, and that's when I also looked for an opportunity to exhibit. So there was a German cultural society at that time. I contacted them. Then they offered me an exhibition at Sheraton, but then we had to have, I had to also have other artists. One of them was Ife Francis, and then another was Elijin. So we had, that's when I had my first exhibition, exhibiting these huge sculptures in Sheraton. So then I remember my mother making a, a comment, oh, this is wonderful. So if you have the paintings on the walls and the sculptures in the center, it makes a beautiful exhibition. So that was the starting point of, to exhibit. I exhibited in Uganda and also looked at opportunities traveling to Nairobi to exhibit. I would travel, take my sculptures and exhibit them. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then I think during that time, somebody, the late Mokasa, Geoffrey, walked in and said, Oh, there's an opportunity for you to, to exhibit, you know, to our uh, artist residence in uh, Vienna. And I said, yes, but you have to pay for yourself. I said, yes, I'm willing to go out and participate, but I don't have the money. And I remember he said, he came, then after he came two days or maybe a week after, he said, there's an opportunity for you. Somebody is paying. Mm -hmm. He never disclosed the name, oh, wow. but that person paid for me to travel to Austria. It was wonderful. This is the best moment I've ever had as an artist. Yeah. Even to date when you Traverse yeah, the, because wow. it was an interest that was 
the time I discovered, because I had made all these huge sculptures using hand tools, mm -hmm. but when I was in, in Vagrind, when where we had the residency, you are supposed to make a sculpture in 10 days. Oh. And then I had worked with, I had traveled with uh, the late Fab Mpachi. I told him, Fab, I've never used power tools, because when I arrived, there were power tools, uh, power saws, grinders. I told him, Fab, I've never handled these tools. He said, don't worry. You know, the greatest thing is when somebody gives you encouragement mm. that you make it, you do it. Indeed, I was able to devote, to make a sculpture which was something like uh, three meters. Mm. And I was able to make it in 10 days, working, at, working along with international artists, Americans, Chinese, and I made it. So when I returned, I don't know, I walked into our studio, no uh, storage, and I found the part tools there. And I said, oh my God, I work on these huge roots. And the professor who was supervising me never mentioned anything about these part tools. But later on, I realized that when you work with uh, hand tools, you have the patience to carve wood. When you're using part tools, they move very fast. You don't take care, take a lot of time to think through mm -hmm. of the forms you are going to make. So, and then of course, after I'd we're talking about the PhD. I kept on exhibiting, looking for opportunities. Because sometimes the opportunities find you, but sometimes you have to look for them. And that's what I've done. And then another, uh, my strength had, was my husband, the late Edward. He supported me he, up to the end of his life. He always supported me. When I would say, Edward, I want to do A, B, C, D, I'm traveling. He said, oh, OK. I, I, I pack my bag, sometimes he's helping me out, and then he takes me to the airport. I'm there, I come back. So he, he also loved art, and he supported me in very much. And I realized as a woman, if I think I've been able to grow because of him. He gave me a lot of support. But 1998, that was a time when I realized something, certain, something was not right. I, maybe, I remember making a sculpture which had boots. And at that time, of course, there's the AIDS, so that, uh, was, there was a lot of HIV AIDS infections. And I remember making a sculpture in gum boots. I don't know why, but then in uh, 1998, I traveled to Namibia for a workshop. I returned, Edward was very sick. And I looked at him, definitely he had, I was sure that he had HIV AIDS, but you cannot prove that somebody is HIV positive until they have tested. Mm -hmm. So I looked at him and I happened to move around and then I met one of these doctors. And to my surprise, the doctor, without even <laughs> giving me some counseling, he just said, I asked him, oh, Edward has been said, yeah. I said, it seems like it is HIV. He said, yeah, definitely it is. He, they just talked anyhow, two of them. They just said it anyhow. They didn't mind whether this person, have, yeah, uh, I'm attached to him, feelings. And then uh, when I asked what Edward, when I asked him, person said, oh, it is TB, but definitely somebody, when he's on TB, he has TB, definitely it was HIV. I talked to a friend of mine, this friend of mine said, why don't you take an HIV test? I took two, three tests, and they were all negative. And that was a trying moment. Then I, I, I remember sitting down on the bed thinking, because I had warned Edward to be careful. But then, as I was judging him, then I had this voice, what if they, it was you they are leaving? And then I got stuck into the relationship. But of course, I, I loved him and had this beautiful daughter. There was no way I was leaving the, the two. I remember my daughter saying, oh, mother. <laughs> because I had to tell her that, you know, we have this. It, uh, problem. Then the girl surprised me. Mommy, I knew. I said, mm, how did you know? Even at the school, they, we, we've been taught about HIV. So that meant also, to me, it was a learning point that parents be open to your children. When you can lie them, fool them around, but they are exposed, they know. Then she says, Mommy, you can go and have another life. There's no way I was leaving my daughter. So I, I stayed to take care of them. But then, by that time, people were not talking. We had a lot of these ghosts all around. And what I did at that time was 
to no, I just kept on doing everything, but stress. Edward is sick, it was too much, and I developed a skin problem. When I went to the doctor, he just said, oh, for him it was the time to test whether I was HIV positive or negative. When he found I was negative, he gave me wrong drugs, which made his whole skin erupt. And then during that time is when I decided that I think I should step down as the head of the sculpture department. But as I was stepping down, then I collected him, why don't you go and do your PhD? And the PhD I wanted to do was in art. And I had to go to the British Council. They supported me, they helped me to look for schools in the university. Universities in the UK. And even Edward supported me when I was writing these applications. So towards the end of 2000, I had a, I won three universities. And then I, I, for what reason, I don't know, I decided to take on Newcastle. I didn't have the funds, but I returned to the British Council and they said the time is not right. I went to the Vice Chancellor, Sebo Fu. They said, no, my daughter, that money is too much. And I think for some time, uh, somebody had walked into the school within the period of four years. This person wanted to do his evening classes in painting. And then later on, taking him out after I see him in my department, I said, why are you here? He said, well, I want to do lessons in sculpture. So he is, he, Yoshi Yoshida he was a very good friend of mine and a family. And later on, as I was asking, I just came and I talked about, oh, I have these schools in the UK, but I don't have funds. Yoshi Yoshida just said, there's funding for you. I said, excuse me, you're talking about British pounds, <laughs> not dollars. I said, yes. And for one month, I didn't take the offer, but the pressures were increased. Then I went to him and said, yes. Kindly uh, offer the, say, give me the opportunity. And then he said, yeah. So this organization, whatever what was called, Greenbelt, they, they paid. And I traveled to the UK. Reaching the UK, I said, hmm, let me read about women and HIV AIDS. And then I realized I had been affected. And, it, and I don't live with the disease, but I had got affected. So then I started developing sculptures. Then the supervisors realized that I was not moving on. I was not getting. So then I, they realized that I needed social science methodologies to do, to develop my sculptures, to communicate HIV AIDS. And my research was developing sculptures for HIV AIDS awareness uh, through the lives of women living with the disease. And of course, I am back to, you have to go through the pilot projects, methodologies of questions, and I was trained in all that. And yeah, so my pilot project in the UK was with IVO. I called them, fortunately, because I had to look for a group of women living with HIV AIDS in the UK. Unfortunately, I went to the NHSC clinic and then I found a pamphlet in Uganda. That meant there were Ugandans living with HIV AIDS in, in the UK. So I called numbers and then IVO, Innovate Vision, uh, whatever vision uh, organization, invited me to London. So the lady asked me, why are you doing HIV AIDS? I said, my husband is sick, my sister is sick, my father died of HIV AIDS. I said, oh, sorry. Then she said, well, you can work with us. Then she said, but you look troubled, traumatized. I said, yes. Then she said, Major Rubaramira can talk to you, can counsel you. So Rubaramira, Major Rubaramira was there, and then he asked me, what is the problem? I said, my husband doesn't talk. I said, when are you going to come to Uganda? I can talk to him. Fortunately, I was flying to Uganda for my three weeks. So Edward picked me up at the app and said, <clears throat> can you talk to, would you like to talk to Major Rubanami? He said, no. But then I had this limited time. I told Major Rubanami that Edward doesn't want to talk to you. He picked up the phone and called him, Mutabanwa, son of so and so. Can you come and we talk? Then he called after Edward called, oh, Lillian, can you go and see Major Rubanamira? Of course, we went. Major Rubanamira gave us audience, I think, for three hours or plus. He talked to us. Then he asked Edward, why don't you talk? He said, and then Edward was terrified. 
he was shaking, said, no, this is my problem, it's not their problem. Then Major told him that, you know, if you don't talk to them, they won't know how to help you out. And then we left. I'm grateful to Major Rwarami at the time he gave me, at that time. So after that, the following day, Edward started taking his medicine openly. But I had had an opportunity to take him to the UK. That one he refused. I talked to his dad. Dad is this opportunity to take Edward. Because my dad was, he was going into clinics and the treatments were not good. He was not responding. And yet day one, when he, when he had been diagnosed, I remember the nurse in that clinic told me that, please take your patient to clinics which are help with, which are good at HIV AIDS treatment. I talked behind his back, my back, his back, I talked to him and he refused. So, yeah. So that was the turning point to do my PhD on, on sculptures that enable to communicate HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. And that strong reason why I had to do it, to do that, I remember when Edward was sick, I talked to his, three of his friends behind his back. One was a medical doctor. He said, I can't come help you. Because Edward kept on, was in denial, sometimes he was crying. And then one was the medical doctor, was the first person. Uh, I told him, you know, can you help me, help us, help me? That, and you talked to Edward, the doctor refused. And then another was a family friend. He, when I told him that we have this problem, he said, no, this is not a family issue. Uh, this, that is a family issue, so he never sorted us. He never gave me any support. And then another worked with city council. I told him, then he said, I knew. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, I knew you people had HIV AIDS. I said, okay. Oh, wow. Then he said, I thought about you. I said, why? Yeah, you, the city council had bought antivirals. I think that was the late 90s and early 2000. They were into uh, medicines for HIV AIDS. This guy kept quiet. And after him, when I talked to him, and, yet, and he had not come out to help, I kept quiet. I didn't talk to anybody about our problem. I knew it was my problem and Edward and my daughter. So full stop. Because even the family, I told them, they didn't come out to help. They all kept quiet. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't blame them, but maybe they were also stigmatized and they were denied. So, going to Newcastle, that's when I made up my mind that I should develop sculptures that encourage talk, people to talk about HIV AIDS. I realized that many people were dying, yet the drugs were in Uganda. Mm. How many? We've lost so many people. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, and of course, um, mm. the, like all of us in one way or the other have been, you know, either directly or indirectly. Yeah. Um, affected by you know HIV and and, and by extension AIDS, mm. um, I'm very keen to hear, and it must be have been a lonely journey as you explained. It was, it was. you, your has just you, um, your husband Edward and your daughter. Mm -hmm. Where did you draw your strength and 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 to just navigate this very lonely time? I think we had. Support for one another because my mother, my daughter said, "Mommy, I'm going to take care of him." That was enough, and we didn't judge him. We took care of him, and we loved him because he supported us. Wow. And now, by extension, now that um, and you continued and completed your 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 doc your doctorate, I'm um, specifically working on sculptures and targeting this subject. Mm. I'm very keen to know when you shared that with the public, what, how did people um, interact with um, the sculptures? Mm. Mm. Well, the first sculptures I made were in the UK. And because of language, uh, culture. I remember developing, the first sculptures were care, love, affection, compassion. Mm. And then, when I made these sculptures, the British did not understand what I was making. Mm. And because of the culture, because all the sculptures I'd made were like, for example, I looked at Winnowing, 
separating the grain from the chaff. Mm. Yeah, that is sieving. We use the the flat basket, and then I was looking uh, the flat basket, and you know everything. Whatever you make has to be meaningful. The bas the flat basket were made of a scream. It is a natural material because it also has pores. It allows fluids, and then by winnowing, it was meant that girl, women should have a choice into when they are having these relationships. But sometimes they don't have. But then in that winnowing sculpture, it shows when they are told, oh, that they are living with the disease. And I also, in fact, it started off with the, because the kind of sculptures, having these, uh, the IVO women, the women who are living with the, with the HIV AIDS, I asked them when I was interviewing, what kind of, uh, I asked them, do you talk to, about HIV AIDS to your children? They said, no. I said, excuse me, your mothers, and you're living with this, and you don't talk to your children? They said, we feel embarrassed. And then somehow I thought first. I said, can we use objects that can encourage us to talk? They said, maybe. So when I returned, after my uh, one month with the IVO in London, I returned to Newcastle, and I started developing more sculptures using utensils, Object, women use in the house that can enable them to talk about the disease. Of course, the winnowing, mm -hmm. but then the winnowing in the house, if you're in the UK, you are using sieves, sieves separate mm, uh, whatever stuff from whatever. Oh, it depends on how you're using it. And then, but I was using winnowing, the flat basket. Then I was making bowls. And then I was relating to the scream, the material, the natural material to cast it on the, around the bowls, to create bowls, why we are receivers. Mm -hmm. And that is why, my, 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 one of the most cases, why women, we are more, the infections among us, we receive the sperms, mm -hmm. the infected sperms, and then they stay, unlike the men who go in and out. And then that, there are more chances for us to get uh, the, the disease, unlike the men. So then I was looking at the, uh, at that time, while in Uganda, they was talking of, about the Ngaboda shield, so people should protect themselves, meaning symbol, a symbol of using condom. Yeah. So I was making all those sculptures in, in the UK, mm -hmm. and the British people didn't, uh, didn't understand. And then uh, with me, because I know most of the infections are heterosexual, it is the penis. And then I remember making a sculpture, and then they are putting on a ring, suggesting condom. And then the British girl said, mm -mm -mm -mm. I said, what? That ring is for sexual arousal. I said, oh, mm. this is not what I meant. So okay. <laughs> the context of the art. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's very so, interesting. So what I did was to get the metal, metal and nail around the what? The penis mm. to suggest condom use. And then I also, I, I also, then the female condom had come on to market, mm -hmm. and then I created the mortar and pestle because mortar and pestle, in fact, it was one of the first pieces I had. I had she, uh, put uh, polythene, uh, polythene around the, 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 the pestle, that is the male organ, because at that time they were telling, saying, oh, acavera. Mm -hmm. So the mortar, is the woman. The person is the man. When you are hee hee hee, that is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Pounding. When you are pounding, that is the sexual <laughs> situation. Yes. <laughs> so this, these captures didn't mean a lot to the British. <laughs> and then I remember reading the, the responses of the women in, in London and I said, I asked, I had asked them, do you want more of this HIV AIDS awareness? And I said, no. Because they had traveled to the UK, they were on good treatment, mm. there was no point. Mm. I said, okay. Then I said to myself, <laughs> I'm wasting my time <laughs> this research, do this research in <laughs> London mm. and in Newcastle. So I took photos and I came down to Uganda. And then I, I had two organizations. I uh, reached out to Muya. And there was a Nakola, Nakola. there's an HIV women organization. And then I went there, I, saw, I took the photos. And then the women said, We don't have no, we don't know what sculpture is all about. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I said, what do they use? They use uh, posters. Then I went to the organizers. They said, Lillian, your sculptures are 11, organi 14 organizations that were moving to them. How oh, do you use sculptures? I said, no, you can't use sculpture. I said, what? Your sculptures are big, they're expensive. We can't use sculpture. And I said, so what can we use? He said, we are coming up with sculptures that are interactive, uh, easy to make, uh, easy, easy to move around, which can relate and inspire talks about HIV AIDS. And then I wondered what sculptures I was going to make. And then before I returned, that I think it was 2003, before I returned to the UK, I asked my mother, what is the cheapest material people use? They said, so. Mm -hmm. didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get much out of it. But then after when I arrived in Newcastle, I started developing sculptures, concepts. I would go into galleries. Mm -hmm. Studying in the Newcastle was such a fantastic idea. I would get out of the university or my flat, move around into galleries, or take trains to London. Then I was reading even about the other artists who had worked on HIV AIDS, like, uh, uh, what was it? There was Felix Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. I remember walking into this gallery. I mean, and then there were streets. And then the people who were mining the exhibition said, oh, streets in, uh, in, in glittering uh, papers. And I said, yeah, pick as much as you want. I picked, I enjoyed <laughs> <laughs> as much. And then I get out. And then Felix was, was, Felix was saying, oh, that's how the eggs is, it is sweet. Right, yeah. And then you are enjoying it. But then when you have HIV AIDS, so when you pick this uh, sweets, you're reducing my weight. I said, oh my God. Wow. It was a powerful it's statement. Okay. So oh, that's wow. how I had to change. As much as I enjoy wood carving, I had to look for concepts that could communicate HIV AIDS. Mm. Yeah, I looked at the red ribbon as other people had done. Mm. And eventually, I thought about uh, soap. I made the bows against small ones, a hundred of people. They were tedious. Mm. Then I remembered about the soap. Soap as a metaphor, mm. cleaning, cleansing. They said, yeah, we should be clean. We should be mindful about the sex we have. Uh, have you gone for HIV AIDS testing? Uh, is your partner, partner tested? Or are you using... So the idea of cleansing made certain making sense. So I went to the supermarkets and bought soap and started coffee, but that was tedious. Then the supervisor suggested, why don't you look for soap as a raw material <coughs> on the net? I did, and I was able to get two materials, opaque or translucent, opaque, and then the translucent, which is almost there that you can see through. And I brought it to the studios and I started making sculptures, uh, models, mm. but the model still relied on the male and the female organ, mm. because that was, it. and then I had made them literally, then the supervisor said, but how do people say when they look at those penises and vagina? So I had to simplify them. And then when I simplified them, then I was able to, um, embed objects into the translucent or transparent mm. and they look they, uh, they they looked good and i said mm. i made a hundred of them saying yeah this is i think this is what i can carry to uganda mm. reaching uganda one of my colleagues said hey these are my sculptures Lydia. what do our people say these are penises and vaginas mm. Say, mm. but then i had also brought the same sculptures on, in our living room and put them on the table and edward was still living which was 2004 and I said, Edward, can you respond to my sculptures? He didn't say anything. So then I went to the women who are living with HIV AIDS. I put them on the table. I was scared because I knew I was stigmatizing them. But then to my surprise, they said, hee hee, they picked them up. Ooh, penises and vaginas. Mm. And then they started laughing and said, okay. They said, how do you relate this to HIV AIDS? Then they started talking. Oh. This is how the disease had affected my penis, my vagina. Mm -hmm. And then, the, because the male organ also had looked like, uh, it looked like the lungs. I said, ah, that is when the lungs had been affected by TB. Mm -hmm. 
These are women who are not highly educated, but they could interpret the HIV AIDS infections in these through the subscriptures. They said, what if there's nothing into these objects? They said, well, that means that it's HIV AIDS free. I said, really? Yeah. Or CD4 count. Yeah. And that also made, now that I was getting, oh yeah, if there's more of these beans or whatever into these captures, infection, less on treatment or just getting infected, they were responding. I was not pushing any word into the, they were telling me what they felt about the disease. And then it was the women. And then after the men said, I had not included the men. Then the men came in and said, oh, you can't leave us behind. I said, excuse me, this research is about women. Then after that thought, then I said, no, I can't get, start getting permission from the UK. I just want to call the men on board. I realized that without the men and the women coming together, we cannot end this war or uh, fight against HIV AIDS. And then as I was happy, I thought, then when I was about to leave, of course, before that time, Edward was about was on his deathbed, was towards his life. And then uh, young men had come to see him. He was into rugby. And then the young rugby boys came around. And then I think they kept on asking, well, when are you going back to the UK to study? And I told them, no, I can't go back until Edward has recovered. Sure, I couldn't leave him. And then all of a sudden, he said, Can you help Lillian? Can you come? Up? Can you help and respond to her questions? That was the moment to realize that Edward had, was supporting my research. Much as I had not responded, but he wanted other people to get involved. But that was also a moment for me because my supervisors had insisted that if your research is communicating HIV, is bring evidence mm -hmm. and there was no way I could talk about the disease without Edward's acceptance. 2005 Edward passed, he died, but I was at home and then a priest visited me and then I was holding these small sculptures, the prisoners and vaginas and I don't know how, I just went to the room and showed them to the priest. Then the priest said, oh, these are beautiful things. Then he said, you are doing this research in Kampal. Why don't you come and do this research interviews in, uh, in Luelo? And then that was the moment also to take a journalist. And yeah, and so, yeah I took a journalist and somebody to also support me while I was interviewing. So when, my, when I took these sculptures, I laid them on the table. The priests were in the background, they never got involved. And then the parishioners came, they looked at them, they laughed. Then I said, okay, this is a moment. Can we start responding to these sculptures in view of HIV AIDS? Then one woman stood up and said, how can you talk about vaginas and penises among our people? Then I was able to reflect and say, how many of you have lost relatives HIV AIDS? Your children have been defied and they have been infected. Or you yourself have been infected. Is it is the moment to talk about HIV AIDS openly? Mm. Then they started responding. Mm. With that time, they said, well, where can we go? Blah, blah. So they responded very well. Then I had, when I had finished that uh, focus group discussion in Wello, then a friend calls me. That was no one else. Says, Lillian, there's an HIV AIDS uh, conference in uh, Munyonyo. So that was also the time to take my soft captures and attend that. And then while I was there, somebody from BBC came, interviewed me. And so then the, the recording was, able, was viewed worldwide. So the soft sculptures were communicating. And then these journals are taken to well. I think they were too. They were able to produce the uh, story, run the story, the same day that conference opened. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. 
So I had three evidences for the supervisors in the UK. But then he also that Edward had accepted that I should carry on with my research. And I remember also asking my daughter, can we talk open when he had died open about this disease, which had killed her dad? She said, Mommy, yes. Mommy, yes, you can talk openly. So I had support from my family that I was able to, that I should be able to talk about the disease, how it had affected us. Yeah, but then I also realized that the soap sculptures were so powerful, especially to the illiterates and who communicate in so many languages. Yeah. But then when I was at Reach Out Muya, I saw the women, some of the women living uh, with HIV, they were pregnant. I asked them, now you are pregnant? Now you are, uh, yet you have HIV AIDS and you are going, you, of course, by that, by that time I think that the, the drug had come which doesn't, which stops the, the transmission to, uh, yeah, to the children. I think maybe it had come. They said, but Lillian, you don't know. I said, what is the problem? Our husband pushes us into sex and they don't want to put on condom. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment to, to decide that my soft sculptures should be registered. And if I'm to sell them, the women should have a percentage. Without fighting HIV, without fighting poverty, you cannot end HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. And it is very evident that I studied in Europe, there's less infections among the women because the women are empowered. Mm -hmm. They can determine the sex they want, whether it is protected or not. They, they have the freedom of choice. And like our women here, and I'm even surprised. We are in the era where people are very, should be very knowledgeable about the HIV infections, mm -hmm. and yet we are still having HIV infections at a high rate, especially about women. Mm -hmm. And sometime back to 2015, I did an, an interview about on the university girls, and many were not aware, or they were aware they didn't mind because they are struggling with their fees. Mm -hmm. So this business of girls at the university being to pay for themselves, it puts us at a high risk yeah. with exposure. She doesn't have the money, and yet the rich man has the, to, can pay for the food. Mm -hmm. And if he says, don't use condom, because she wants the school fees, so yeah. we should fight poverty to end this HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. And then continuous, um, we have to have continuous messages running around. Mm -hmm because maybe they are, they are less now. Mm. Yet there should be emphasis to have more of HIV AIDS awareness. Mm. Yeah. Mm. People know, but then because of po poverty, they yeah. fall back. They fall back to survival. Yeah, so the fit is. Yeah. You, you said something very interesting earlier on um, mm. that I want to bring out. Um, the I guess it's also society's perception of art, right? Something that your father said, saying that yeah, mm. you're doing art, but uh, wh where would you get money from? Mm. Right? Yeah, true. Um, and the exposure that you've had, having you know traveled across the world mm. uh, and seeing how people in the I would say more developed world appreciate art and artists being paid better mm, <laughs> there yeah, yeah, compared true. to here um i'm just curious to know um like what what has motivated you to stay home and you know create the art at home as opposed to and you could be seated in italy somewhere uh with your own glass gallery um with your sculptures going for you know ten thousand a piece but you chose to stay home i'm, I'm just curious to know what the motivation was one, when I was in the UK studying, of course I had a scholarship, sponsorship, but I remember my sponsor uh, say, told me, advised me that you can still get some money from Makerele books. Indeed, when I went, uh, they offered me money for station, for uh, stationary books and what have you. Of course, I had a good uh, uh funding but art is there's a lot to, oh, you, uh, there's a lot of money you need for to buy the materials and everything so i think because i remember asking for more money from my sponsor then my sponsor said no we've given you enough money you can't give go beyond so then that's when he advised me so i came back to my 
they were able to give him every year they would give me some money mm. for the books and what have you. And then, of course, my salary mm. was kept on being for all those years I was away. And I remember a scenario at the University of Newcastle, a lecturer got an accident. Three months, she was being fully paid. Six months, there was no pay. She was, she, her side was not coming into her bank. And then I said, oh my God. So when I, when I would have said while I was doing my PhD, and if I got two opportunities, but I looked at the offer Makele had given me because all my salary was put into my account. And then I said, little, it was little, but it meant a lot to me. It was like you are on a tree and you cut it. That if I didn't return. Then I said to myself, if I don't return, I will not pass on this information up okay, to the other students. Mm -hmm. I, I felt I was mean. And I said, no, I should return to the tree which has fed me, mm. <laughs> which has helped me. Yeah, so I returned. Mm. That was the major reason, no, because of Makere, I had to return. Of course, they ground us, but still people have gone beyond that, and maybe they have paid off, you know? But I said, now I should return, mm. so that I pass on this information you know, to the students. Mm. And then, one of the things I've also noted, I've made two huge exhibitions. One was in, uh, around, before I left, there was a big uh, group of sculptures, which were around 54. They were taken to, they were exhibited in uh, Nairobi. And then, of course, that was the time I was also in the UK. And then these sculptures left, and they have never returned. So while I was in Newcastle, there are sculptures, uh, some of them were sold. And then while I, while I was in the UK, Newcastle, an opportunity came. I, I had a friend and then she was in Norway, bagging. Then she says, Lydia, you have an opportunity. No, I just moved around. I said, I wish I can exhibit some of these sculptures here. And then she said, then I returned to Newcastle. Then she said, they have given you an opportunity to exhibit your sculptures in Bergen, Bergen Museum. And then at that time, because some certain things happen in strange ways, maybe God has protected me all through. So that time Edward had, yeah, he had passed. Then I didn't also have money for my continuation in the UK because after his death, I spent one year without, I didn't have the, the funding, he had stopped. At the same time I was in the UK, I had to complete my, my studies and have not so so funny. I remember at that time when I was grieving and I couldn't even go do these extra jobs. But the fortunate thing by, with Europe at that time in the UK that I was paying something almost 10,000 pounds, but after three years it, is, it reduces to home fee and at that time it was 500. Mm -hmm. So that meant I was able to pay for myself, but still you need sources. So when I, I remember crying a lot and then uh, sick, I, I walked into the church and told God, I've come to clean your church and can you look for funds? He did, he did. Mm -hmm. So while I was there, uh, well, then I will, I will go into this church but the church also supported into my mentally, mental well-being of getting better. Because I realized that there were women there who were suffering from cancer. One of them, one, of, one woman had, had, had lost her son, and yet the son had just married. I looked at the young girl who was just married, and her husband had died. Then I said, okay, at least I've lost my husband, but I still have a daughter. I said, okay. <laughs> you know those, those yeah. strengths I was getting from that church, mm. from that church. But then I was also able to get people would call and say, "Oh, Lillian, there's a workshop. Can you run a workshop?" And we we're paying highly. I'd do this workshop one hour, two hundred pounds. Mm. One hour, two hundred pounds. That's how sweet it was. But <laughs> yeah. but in the end, I was able to pay my accommodation, food, and everything. Yeah. 
So 2007, when I finished my, 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 my PhD, I had enough money, mm. but I had to, 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 to ship all my stuff and come back to Uganda. Mm. Ah, you also mentioned about how, you know, remind me again, I think I'm, I'm skipping a while. Then, because I've traveled a lot, I see a lot of our sculptures, my sculptures going out. Mm -hmm. And then that I said to myself, many of my sculptures are going out, but there's no facility to store. There's no, I should have, in fact, I thought about the gallery in 1990, around 95, I was in Mozambique, and then there were these great sculptors, they had galleries. And then I said, one day I should have my own gallery. And then I traveled to these workshops, then I said, mm, one day I should also have a residence. But I, ha I had these uh, ideas into my head, but then the starting point. Mm -hmm. Of course, when Edward left, the house was on a foundation. The foundation was bad. I had to redo the, the foundation. Then I, that was the moment I said, now, because for him, it was a house, uh, it was building a house for the family. Now he had gone. My daughter is not there anymore. Then I said, I should have rooms which can able, enable artists to live and work here. At the same time, I should retain some of my sculptures so that they are not so, that people can come and watch because we are losing out on the wood. Some of these huge woods <coughs> in future will not be there anymore. But then I also would like to train artists to, to, to maintain their wood carving profession. So that is the reason for this gallery, mm -hmm. to train and also to preserve some of the wood sculptures. Yeah. Fantastic. Now that we are at the gallery, mm -hmm. that was, was an initial dream turned into reality, mm -hmm. um, we would really like to hear more about the individual sculpt because this is a collection of your body of work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we'll have, um, we'll, we'll, this is a way of moving yeah, we'll to yeah. the objects and then you can um, just share with us mm -hmm. about, um, you know, what inspired you and some of your favorite, actually, your favorite uh, pieces. I know that's a weird question. Dr. Lillian, this is a fascinating piece. Um, There's so many materials that are being used, oh. and I'm just curious to know what what does each material stand for? Uh, well, this sculpture is called "We uh, Knowing," separating from the grid from the chaff. Mm -hmm. This is uh, an activity done in villages when they are winnowing mm -hmm. beans from husks or millet. So I look at this, this material, I made the flat baskets. So it's made of scream, which is a natural material. It has pores, it allows fluids. Mm -hmm. But then we are looking at the African girl, and this has curry shells. So these car shells uh, relate to, in the past, it is money. So I'm looking at money. So this woman is holding up and her life, maybe she needs money for herself or for her children. <clears throat> but then during this process, we are looking at HIV AIDS. So we have this basket, flat basket. Before it used to have latex. Latex is a material which is used for condom, uh, for condom. And then I'm um, suggesting that much as you're into prostitution, use latex. So latex is, that is the material. Yeah, the rubber. But with time, it's also a natural material, it disintegrates. So this capture was done in 2004. Over time, because of heat, it has also disintegrated. But 
people, women should be aware to use the condom mm -hmm. if they are to go into relationship. But then in this one, we see the nails suffering, living with HIV AIDS. So the nails, the suffering, maybe she has cancer, but I can relate to the nails as pain in, in the body, but it's the pain at the same time, disease. Mm. And then the woman told me that they enjoy sex. So this one had latex covering up. So I was telling them, can you please use latex, uh, the condom, when you're into sex, into the sex, so that they shouldn't pass on the disease. But still, mm. this one, because of time, the, the rubber also sense. got destroyed mm. because of time and weather. Okay, yeah. And then the women, of course, told me that when we are when we are told that we are HIV positive, they felt shattered. So I was using mirrors and breaking them for the shatteredness. Of course, to make you feel that if you are told they are positive, you feel shattered. But the positive thing is when you are cancelled and you are on treatment, the shatteredness gets back into reality. Mm -hmm. That we have less shatteredness into our lives. Okay. And then, <coughs> this one we are seeing the latex, the balls, to emphasize the nature of morphology among women. We are containers, mm. we contain, but we have to, we have to use protection. Sure, yeah. Are you using the female condom or you're encouraging your man to use condom? Mm. Of course, this is the pain and the suffering women go through when they're living with the disease. Mm. And then some women told me, uh, no, okay, this one, has flimsy material mm. that not all condoms are safe. Mm. Oh wow. Mm. Yeah. So one has to be careful. So when when the balls are upside down, the women were telling that they want didn't they, they had abstained. So what, some women oh, wow. have abstained from sex. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Either they are infected or not, then they say no, we don't have to do anything with sex. We don't we are not sure. Mm -hmm. So it would be rather abstain. Mm -hmm. This one is wood, and it is a pharas, a male organ, but the man leads the game. And below are the women, so it is about polygamous. Mm -hmm. So all this, the man is happy grinning, but what, what he doesn't realize is that these women can have extra relationships and bring the disease to him, vice versa. Right. Yeah. Incredible. Now, there is this fantastic, <coughs> extravagant piece yeah. um, from 1990, 1991, mm. um, from your, I think it was the, the, your thesis paper for your master's degree. What's yeah. the story behind um, Olugambo? It's not Olugambo. No, Kavuyo. Kavuyo. Sorry. <laughs> the story behind Kavuyo, what inspired you um, to pick the Kavuyo topic? Kavuyo is a huge root star made of a ficus tree root star. Yeah. So I made it at that time we are having wars, the liberation wars, mm -hmm. of course they had ending, but I remember the time when we are going through the wars, mm -hmm. running up and down. Mm -hmm. So in this Kavuyo, I see creatures running through mm -hmm. each other, the movements, wow. the struggles, because when the roots are down there, they find boulders mm -hmm. and then they try to go around them. As they go around the boulders, the huge stones, then they are able to create beautiful forms. That's what the world is forgetting, that wow. the roots are one of the best, well, it depends on where they are, they, they create, you are able to create unique sculptures which you mm -hmm. never see again. Okay. So I don't have no, any intention to sell so this sculpture. So. There are two sculptures made of roots. They have fantastic forms, mm -hmm. grotesque form, which you never see again. Most of the roots, sculptures are made from uh, roots. You can never see them again. That's because roots are in the source. Mm -hmm. They have different uh, source forms, sources of obstructions. Mm -hmm. So they will never be the same. Oh wow, like yeah. the there's beauty in chaos and they're resilient somehow people yeah. managed. Yeah, that's yeah. love. That, those are the times we went through. 
Wow. Yes. But still came out strong. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm. Dr. Linian, you've spoken about red and you're wearing red. Mm. I wanted to ask, this is a question that we've always been, we've asked each other. How would you describe your life in a color? What color would you use to describe your life? Mm. Red is danger. <laughs> Uh, but red also is attractive. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, I used to keep on, in the past I used to put on red because my mother wore always, my dresses were always red, bright colors, yellow, red. But then after I got so tired of those colors and I went into black, mm -hmm. <laughs> white. White is less because of the environment, mm -hmm. it's dirty. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have <laughs> particular color. color. But yeah. once I put on something and I feel good at it, that's it. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Okay. Um, and then there is this magnificent piece. Yeah. Um, ancestors. Ancestors mm. was done during the, when I was doing my masters. Mm. I call it ancestors because the sculpture, the forms which are here, you cannot see them anymore. There is that huge face. There is an owl. That is an owl. Mm. There are lizards. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Chameleons. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of sculptures, mm -hmm. of forms mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. add, add into this wood, into this sculpture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the human. The form, yeah, form yeah. at the bottom yeah. holding. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. inspired you to make this piece? Mm, you know, when you are working with roots, you might have your ideas, but they, they push you. Oh, wow. They push you to what you should produce. Mm. So, um, usually I'm into faces, uh, that's, but then you see, sometimes you can't create. You can't create a, a face, so that means maybe you're looking at, observing at animal creatures, mm -hmm. and then you, you, you push, you struggle to, to, to develop forms out of them. Mm -hmm. That related to the structures, mm -hmm. the form that is, that is being offered by the root. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then this particular piece? These sculptures, uh, this one, the these two. I made them at the same time while I was at the, after my PhD, mm. when I was reflecting on the girls and HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. So I realized, well, the women have to, the girls, the university girls should be thoughtful. And then for me, this was a cup, a cup for, which they put on when they are graduating. And then this was relating to the books. But the idea is that we, the young women at the university should tr try to see that they finish their studies and when they are still strong enough and pursue their studies and finish because so much has been in, uh, in, invested into them by the government or by their own parents mm. so they should not play around mm -hmm. yeah okay. yeah the stamina sometimes you can uh, have little but you have to be focused mm. yeah Dr. Lillian, um, we have seen incredible pieces um, on the other side of the gallery. Yes. Um, here we have a collection of the musicians, but mm. also this specific one on um, on the table. Yes. What's the story behind? Uh, going back to the HIV AIDS story, this is a conceptual artwork. It is wood carving, but then it has other parts, forms, which are made from balloons. But then I was I tied balloon string on the balloon and blue, but later on it collapsed. It was suggesting intravenous feeds to the sculpture because the the reality of HIV AIDS is you fall sick and then you are hospitalized. You are all alone. That's why people should be mindful that when you get the disease, you are on your own mm. when you fall sick. Much as you are into this blue uh into mischief but at, when the when the reality comes in and you are sick you are on your own so it is like this is suggesting on your own or you are sick but then uh these were intravenous feeds 
so suggested uh, using balloons. So those which have collapsed, or for example, when I met them, there was Eva Hart, she was into balloons and string. And then I thought, well, I can use balloons to suggest uh, intravenous feeds. But at the same time, I didn't know how I, sh I would handle this, because Eva's balloons, some never collapsed. Because when you put string on balloon and glue, eventually the balloon uh, loses and then it collapses and then mm -hmm. the intravenous bottle is whatever, suggestion uh, collapses. But if you put paper on balloon and glue and then you tie string, so it will remain. So those balloons with paper and string have remained over the time, over years. Mm. Yeah. So the ability that the sick people should go for treatment and then they will get better. So it is, this piece encourages you to go for fee, uh, for treatment at the same time to warn you that when you're sick, you are all alone, mm. isolated. But at the same time, I'm also seeing these other figures, mm. the musician. Yes, sometimes sick people need music around them. Mm. And then maybe they're singing. But on the other hand, it could be the gossipers. Because gossipers, Positive gossiping, that you, that's when you are, you are talking about this person, but you are finding ways of how to enable this person to live long and get better fit and live, live longer. Mm -hmm. But then when it is negative, that is when people talk at the same time, they are not there for you. That's like mm -hmm. the experience we went through with Edward when we were sick. They would talk, they would knew where the medicines that the antivirals were available, but they never came up to see. How many people have we lost yeah. oh, because wow. of bad gossiping? Yeah. Mm. So good gossiping yeah, is advocacy. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. It's Interesting. Amazing. Yeah. All right. And then there are these giant pieces. Mm. Um, very large compared to the, the, the pieces what you've seen. What's the what's the story behind the size and the, the, the pieces themselves? I've been told by a powerful art uh, sculptor. Professor Francis Nagenda. He's a small man, but yeah, he makes huge sculptures. And when I saw him, I said, well, if you can make those big, huge sculptures, I can also make them. But then there's also this intimidation of women that we are doing nothing. We are, yes, I said, well, you can talk much against women, how we are not valuable, what, but then my valuable, my strength is in my sculptures. And if Professor Nagena can do it, I can also as well do big, make big sculptures. And I also love big. They are a source of inspiration. They, are encourage, they give me encouragement to move on in life. That whatever problems, issues I find in life, that I can succeed. And yeah, especially we have this big wood around us. So why not take the advantage and make big sculptures? Why only rely on small sculptures? And the ability that I'm able to use power source, electrical tools, that gives me the chance to go big. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. This is amazing. And this piece is? Uh, that, she's it is a graduate. Of, it reminds me of a graduate. The, um, okay, the, the head doesn't so, so much. But when it is spreading out, this piece gave me a lot of trouble to make it. But then after a friend told me, but you're always making heads. The minute I make the head, then I would see the hands. And then oh, it gives a feeling of a, a gown. Mm. And the chains, yeah. well, it could be the rope, the design, the decoration. But the, the, the reality of the chains is to hold this wood from splitting. Mm -hmm. I use chains a lot. To, to retain the wood. Even sometimes the metals are to retain the wood from cracking. Mm -hmm. They add beauty, but at the same time, it is a, a workmanship to control wood cracking. So that's why sometimes I use the metals to mm -hmm. hold the wood together. Mm -hmm. But this piece has also passed so cuts because I kept on worrying that it would crack, but I think the cracks the power so cuts enable the enables the wood to breathe. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the art and science as we spoke about oh, earlier. <laughs> <laughs> In Uganda, do we have any art residency spaces? Yes, we have 32 degrees. And I think there are others which have come up. They mentioned something in, some, in Mokono. It could be an art residence. Mm, and maybe the massacre. There is also something oh, happening massacre. in the massacre, the yeah, massacre, massacre gallery. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. This is an incredible... <laughs> Um, which um, has been 20 years in the making. Yeah, What's yes. the story behind this? It is about the women. Women, uh, they are powerful. It looks at the power and the strength of a woman. So that's what I wanted to make. And sometimes I relate them to myself. Yes, I'm small, but I'm a powerful woman. I love it. <laughs> but, uh, I love it. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, and then it should, well, when I'm gone, then I should be rem remembered in one of my sculptures that I used to live. So that means I wouldn't want these sculptures to go abroad. It should be one of the sculptures to remain, to test time, at the same time to show the ability of the women, women's strength in good carving. Mm. You have few women good carvers. Yeah, because m women are subjected to marriage and conceiving. Yes, of course, you see he's also bulky. And, so we are, we are looked at as just uh, producing kids. Yet this, we hold the lives of the children and the men. We are powerful, but sometimes we are disregarded. So I want the women to be empowered, to feel strong, and affirm themselves that they are powerful, that they know it all, and they rule the world. Yeah, they do. Yeah. It's only that the men and the underwriters. Yeah. What was the inspiration to start this body of work 20 years ago? Uh, Professor Nagenda, I, I think a tree fell at the university and then Professor got one huge log and I said, oh, with his, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always walk, uh, I, when he, I, I, I challenge myself, I said, well, if he does it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. So he got two locks and then said, Lydia, that is yours. He said, okay. Mm -hmm. Then he started carving. But then he was, when he was about to complete it, he said, but Lydia, you should finish your sculpture. But I think other issues had come in, like you had fallen sick. Mm -hmm. He finished his, I didn't finish mine. But I hope soon, maybe next year, I should finish this work. Has, has the vision that you had in mind for it 20 years ago changed over time? Like, it's well, still the same. Still the same. Wow. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I need to work. I, I have it market in the gallery, but it, it hasn't changed. It's still the same. Yeah. I have a question around the, mm -hmm. the, the, the art buyer's space. Mm -hmm. um, and really, because right now there is a lot of global interest. Right now, African contemporary art is at the center mm. of, of of global interest. But as you rightfully said, a lot of the buyers are not necessarily from the continent or even from Uganda. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I am curious to um, know how we can cultivate art buyers and collectors locally um, as an, an artist. What would what was your position regarding that? One, uh, of through, through education, mm -hmm. let old schools teach art. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is the uh, future market for the art within. Mm -hmm. And then there are, you know, I, young, I think when we went through COVID, a lot has come up. Mm -hmm. Recently, I met a group of artists, and for them, they are to encourage the, these social rights around who have the money and have empty houses. So for them, it is about encouraging Ugandans to exhibit, and they do uh, exhibitions with them. But there are also Ugandan uh, collectors who are also on the scene. So they walk around the galleries and they are able to buy, yeah. But I believe if more have more knowledge, because some of them are being guided, oh, that is the good artwork. Yet, there are many artists who are doing good work. But because of an individual too who directs them, oh, this is the greatest 
Yeah. Yeah, there are others. Yeah. And then I think uh, globally, these days you cannot easily say your work abroad unless you have a curator. That I experienced when I was in uh, New uh, in in, in uh, London. I went. I walked around and I wanted to see where I can sell my work. And then they asked me, "Who is presenting Who's you?" Yes. At the freeze, that put me off. Yes. Oh, Baba, you've mentioned something very important: the power of the galleries, because galleries. It is the curators. So, the curators uh, yeah. Here. So the gal the galleries need curators curator. to give them the right the people who should be they should exhibit. Mm. So, but in the past, I used to uh, sell, to take promote my work, take it. I was I used to do it personally, but now yeah. it's not possible. Well, it is possible, but you go. Th but when you have a good curator mm. to mine your work, mm. the sky is the limit. That's really incredible. And and considering Dr. Lillian, you are an established artist. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And now imagine yeah. these young. Because it's very difficult, I think, finding um, that representation. There's only uh, yeah. a specific number of whether it's galleries and curators available, yeah. and they can only take in a certain, I think they can only represent a certain number. That yeah, leaves true. majority yeah. of the artists then choosing to abandon the profession. Exactly. But mm. I think people should, artists shouldn't uh, give up because you keep on working, somebody will come From and your find work. Get involved into workshops, in, into exhibitions, that's when you can be found. But if you produce work and then you are at home, mm -hmm. that's the reason why I went to the Sanson Gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I go into these other exhibitions to look for clientele because when I stay here, well, but still, on, on the other hand, if you're able to show work well on websites, mm -hmm. yeah. People cannot, there are so many, the avenues have increased. Yeah. It's only the artists to keep on working mm -hmm. and do good work. When the work is good, they always, they always be a market and people will find you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think like Lorna, as we are talking, uh, discussing earlier, the, the role that technology plays in uh -huh. sort of immersing um, that art experience, right? Uh -huh. With like VR, um, augmented reality, uh -huh. virtual reality. So, True. Yeah, I mean, Yes. There's a lot of opportunities to converge the science and the, the art, art together um, yes. to create opportunities for yeah, the African Renaissance. For the African Renaissance, yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's really you know that what, uh, exactly that because um, at the end of the day, oh. we need to um, support. We need to support um, um, artists. I have a quick question around because this is intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, how do we how what, what goes on in the pricing of pieces and the pricing of um um what because it var i don't it, the art market is very confusing because there's auctions that go at prices people are confused about mm -hmm. what governs um what governs you know the kind of the pr the, the pricing model for the, even the primary but also the secondary art market because that is what i think seems very far away it's like for super rich people um that we cannot afford afford art what, what goes into that the the minds of um i think that model and are our artists aware of you know the value of their work um as part of their education well if, once the work is good mm. that determines because you don't want to sell a network which is going to collapse tomorrow <laughs> and I, Still call fall back on the who is your curator. Mm -hmm. If you have one, they determine. Okay. They determine. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they sell peanuts, but because they are well, they are well established curators, you can sell anything. They have and a network. Just, yeah, they. In fact, they they rule the artwork. It's a network. Mm -hmm. It's the networking. It's the curator. Oh, wow. Then in, in school, mm -hmm. in, so is there a career path for curators? What's the, their background? It should be history of art, mm -hmm. mainly, but then there should also be marketing and communication. But at the moment, we don't, I don't think we have a school for curators. Mm -hmm. That should be involved. 
uh, that should be uh, that curriculum should be taken on by the universities. Mm -hmm. We are missing out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yet it, it the ones which determines the work of the artists, artists. mainly. Wow, mm. amazing. And um, quick question on your students: mm. Where do most of them go after university, especially the female artists? <laughs> the female artists, yeah. Yeah. if you are fortunate and enough and have husbands. Well, men, men, of course, are expected to get married. But if you get married to a man who doesn't support you in art, that's the end. And then at the same time, if you don't keep on practicing, especially the women, you lose it out. Because you have, you are, there's a time where you have to con get married, conceive, and that's like 10 years. So if not being producing within that time, it's very hard to come up. And then it also depends. We have had students who not literally are interested in art is because that the cut-off points push them to art. To art. Mm. art. We are putting energy into students who are not really interested. Mm. But I think also if we have fun, like for example abroad, there there's always money for artists. Mm -hmm. That even if you don't have a job, but if you have a proposal, somebody will find the, the organization will find you and you continue with your art. So here it is really tough. It is hard. Interesting yeah. about that pa building on what you said about patronage. Yeah. Um, if and I, I could be wrong, but I remember that oh. there has been a time in Uganda where there was actually art, art patronage, either in the sixties or the seventies. Mm -hmm. Was that? Um, what what go i think my my question is what goes who determines um dedicating for example patronage national government is it the government or are those are independent buyers or believers um to set up those kinds of large art funds that support artists even in the gaps um where when they are making but not necessarily selling that should have it should be the government so the art buyers but because I like, I was in Zimbabwe, and then they had these groups, and then there was these one or two men, they would get, because Zimbabwe has very good artworks in stone, and then even that reminds me of Ruth Shefena in Nairobi, she was determining, she had a large clientele of people who would buy art, but at the same time she would determine what is done, what, is, what artists should produce. So of course, those who agreed with her moves and interests, they were able to sell. Mm -hmm. And those, I remember a friend of mine was in a, he was, he was a, a graduate, and mm -hmm. because he didn't follow Ruth Schaffner's styles, he couldn't sell. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah, he had to, so I, he opted out of art, but I told him, you know, this is time. You don't have to rely on one person. You make your work. What interests you? You always find market here. But then you find that artists, well, they are so they call the naive, but they had a kind of art they did, which interests, which Ruth Schaffner's clients uh, had interest in, and they were selling globally and high prices. For example, we had Jack Katalikawe, who was a Ugandan. People who manage the art industry, I think. Have a problem with all my bags. Yeah. Yes. Because they have, if they have the language, they'll tell the client, oh, this is good work. Mm -hmm. They have it. But if they also have the artist ability, they push. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's interesting. So there's so much power in the role of the gallerist. Yes. Because they are the ones who deal with the sellers, the marketers. So yeah. they determine. Yeah. That is actually quite interesting. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who have the network of global exhibition here and so we present um, yes. new work. So that becomes a very, very a central part in yeah. governing the sector. Wow. But mm -hmm. doesn't that essentially must start to cause those in because it feels like to get great out there, you have to be super rich. Right? So it, it sort of excludes it becomes a barrier for entry for you know new emerging artists. Um, but also it limits the variety of like the number of artists that the, the, the people can buy from. So how do you think that can be 
like art can be more decentralized so that a certain class of people can also get to experience and appreciate art. I think when you, the more one exhibits, mm. and then your prices are reduced, mm. so that and even people have to be a parent mm. to know you. Mm. And if you do more of the marketing, then even the local events can they they want more money. But even if you don't, mm. because it's all about the interest mm. and negotiating. Yeah, if you can do a lot of more negotiating with our local people or, or with our Uganda and sell the art to them, then that means we are creating the market. Mm -hmm. It all boils down to education. Yeah. Education. If we are, we are mm -hmm. like lo mm -hmm. locals, whether it's Ugandan or African, we are educated on the, the importance and value of art. When we begin then, it will become very natural for people to then um, to buy, to buy and appreciate. Yes. And then at the same time, the value of art increases with time. Yes. yes. So some even as now are uh, away. Art has an investment. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I see young people yes. now going to be collecting for financial reasons. Yeah. Which is the, in more developed countries, actually, most of those big banks have art collections. They, they, they have um, private collections or so they keep collections yeah. and they're the ones that go in the secondary market and auction them. So there is that group of art as an investment. But still, foundation you still should and be able to appreciate, um, appreciate mm -hmm. the art, the true art for what it for, for what it is. So there's that there's that there's that balance. But the good news is that the continent, the time is now. Yeah. There is so much attention. Um, yeah, that is very good. Mm -hmm. But let us start from home. Oh, oh. yeah. Let us have policies. For example, artists. Whether you have works with different artists, and then. We are too. Well, I'm surprised that you go into the Serena. Mm -hmm. The art which is exhibited is full. Wherever the curator or whatever the curator can use, mm -hmm. to use it. Mm -hmm. we should support our own. Okay, it can be really international art, but that's also support with our own. Fantastic. We have. I have one more question for you, Dr. Lee, and then it's um, looking forward into the future. What are you most optimistic about in, for the Ugandan art at 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 sea? Mm -hmm. Say it again. Looking into the future, where do you see the Ugandan art scene looking like, and what are you most um, optimistic about? I think the future is bright. I think the future is bright because of the means of exposure. We have the social medias, we have the Facebook, we have the Twitter, we have the, oh, the name is Instagram. Yes. You have a very lovely page, by yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. That was developed by Martha Kazung. She was one of my students. She has studied curatorship in German. And then she says, Dr. Lydian, can you employ me? I said, Martha, I don't have the money to employ you. Just find <laughs> your, your means of selling my work. That's fine. But me to employ Martha, a person who has studied curatorship in, in, in German. But she's good. When she finds a market for my work, she, she sells. And she gets up, she takes off a good percentage, and I'm happy with her. Mm. That she's very royal mm. when she sells my work, and I'm happy. And then uh, another thing is also documentation, mm. writing. Our works should be written. Mm -hmm. we, should, I, we artists should have an emphasis to write. Well, that means the arts, art works are recorded, mm. they are documented, and of course, when they are films, that is. Excellent. So I'm happy that you've come to do this yes, job for part me. of authorship. It's <laughs> part, of, part of building the, the portfolio is very important. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, wow. And with uh, Olga, any last question? We are all I blowing mean, still. We could just, go on. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed the conversation. And oh, yeah, yeah, just just to be, because Lon and I are very well balanced people, both scientists, but now trying to 
reignite our artistic side. I think this this has been a very, very interesting conversation and, and yeah. learnings for us. So yeah. yeah. And hopefully we can be your art promoters. Well, we hope to see. No, that was, that's no yeah. directly saying guys yeah, so buy a piece, you, yes. You, you. Exhibition day. You she had she had a, yeah. you yes, she had the pre she introduced she had a panel um you were there. at your first exhibition. Yeah, you you saw it, yes. Yeah. But at least you understand. <laughs> but now for us the dream is to get that into the house. Yeah. Like add yeah. it to my small collection. Yeah. She knows. Oh, she has a bunch of Whenever I am travel, very travel. big on, yeah, on yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. But now an established artist with like a signature yeah. with a, uh, you know, so that I build my even, even the provenance. Photo, the photo with the artist, like this yeah, is yeah. evidence <laughs> that I acquired this art piece and I will put it there. As yes, yeah. that is the dream. Wow. Why at least one of, um, one of Uganda's I mean, most revered Sculpture. sculptors and one of the only women specifically that we know. Yeah. So that's very important. I think that would really build because the messaging is very important, and mm. I'll be educating people every time they walk into the house. Discover, mm. you know, some of because oh, bringing the museum into the house—that's a concept that really? playing with it. Yeah. Oh, but I mean, on behalf of you know Arch Africa, Lona and I, we really thank you for putting your um creative genius to use, especially talking about a disease that ravaged the continent yeah. um so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're doing really like i said you're you're very very smart as I'm as smart, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> i kept on telling guy very very smart like okay i'm like this this is this for me is just genius yeah, yeah. creative yeah. genius that's that's the, the yeah that i think above all part god gives you the the, the ability to 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 move all through that those challenges because i remember i was at the university of newcastle there were students they were being uh uh british they were paid for and then after of course i graduated after six years and then i asked oh how so and so I said, oh, they never finish and you said i had so much on my hands i was facing too many challenges i was able to finish and they didn't i was shocked so, you, and that means that you work to your best, you do your best, and then God also, yeah, that's the rest. You can't, you can't sit there, oh, I lost Edward, yes, and what next? He went. <laughs>